Good afternoon and welcome to the Chamber's presentation of the State of the Port of Wanimi with President of the Board of Commissioners, Jess Ramirez, and Kristen Dikas, CEO and Port Director. I'm Nancy Lindholm, President and CEO of the Oxnard Chamber of Commerce. This presentation is part of our Network of Knowledge series to keep our business community informed about issues affecting our local economy, labor laws, pandemic resources, and more. We'll get started in just a minute after I introduce our sponsor and explain the format for today's program. Thank you to UCLA Health for sponsoring this presentation. We sincerely appreciate their support. Today, uh, we have Dr. Sean Whalen with us to talk about the services they provide in our community. Dr. Whalen, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Hello, hi, is everyone uh, seeing hear me right now? Could you turn your camera on? Okay, how are we now? We see you. All right, hi everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Sean Whalen. Uh, UCLA is really happy to support the city of Oxnard and the port. Um, I am a board certified uh, family medicine doctor. I joined the Ventura practice here a couple months ago. As a family doctor, I see patients of all ages from children, adolescents, young adults into geriatrics. Um, we are open for business now. We're doing video visits and in-person visits. They have a really good screening process. Um, to come in, make sure everyone stays safe. Um, and the, you know, in these trying times, it is important to still stay on top of your health more than ever. We have our flu vaccines available. Um, and in addition, you know, I really encourage all of you to do what you can to still um, get outside, be active, um, address any concerns that are gonna make sure you're staying your optimal um, achieving your optimal health. Along those lines, um, at the end of the talk, I will be able to distribute a little blueprint I put together about um, achieving wellness and vitality. Again, um, real pleasure and honor to be able to support um, the city of Oxnard and the port. And uh, thank you for your time and look forward to the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whalen, and thank you to UCLA Health. Well, uh, let me explain the format for today's program. Uh, first, we'll hear from President Ramirez, and then CEO Dicas will follow. Time permitting, we'll entertain questions at the end. At any time during the broadcast, uh, you can type your questions in the Q&A module, which is the conversation bubble um, with the question mark in its center on the right side of your screen. Uh, and I understand there will be a quiz at the end, so you'll want to pay close attention so you can win some cool port swag. Uh, before I introduce President Ramirez, I uh, just wanted to note that the 2020 Chair of the Board of the Oxnard Chamber of Commerce, Selena Zacharias, also serves on the Board of Commissioners of the Oxnard Harbor District, which is the governing body of the Port of Wanimi. Thank you for your public service, Selena. And now on to our speakers. Uh, Jess Ramirez uh, worked for the Port of Wainimi as a casual longshoreman um, in the 70s and 80s. Uh, <clears throat> after 18 years, he gained membership in the International Longshoremen's and Warehouse Union Local 46, where he retired in December of 2018 uh, after over 51 years of service. Jess has a passion and commitment for helping the disadvantaged and the underserved. He has been recognized for his community service by many groups, including El Concilio Family Services, the Oxnard Police Chiefs Community Organization, and the California Parent Teachers Association, to name a few. Uh, with his knowledge of harbor and maritime 
issues and a commitment to public service and the environment, Jess was elected to the Board of Harbor Commissioners of the Oxnard Harbor District, where he continues to serve six years during the port's greatest period of expansion. Uh, President Ramirez, I'm turning it over to you. Could we have your microphone? Okay. Now I'm taking my mask off because the only person I have here is my uh, my associate director. Um, thank you, Nancy, and thank you uh, for the chamber for hosting this event today, and also all those people who are joining us to watch this important message that that we're going to deliver uh, in combination with myself and Kristen. Uh, Nancy, again, thank you for bringing all the your business leaders together. And uh, I, my heart goes to those people who have been affected by the COVID. This is an unprecedented time and uh, things are really strange. So uh, this is the first time that I do this out of a, without an audience, okay? Uh, normally normally I do do, do my, my, my speech with an audience that I can, I can do a little bit of dancing, make it fun, but uh, so I hope I don't bore you with uh, with my message. Again, Nancy, thank you so much, and also I want to give a shout out to our longshoremen that has kept this port operating for the last, since March. We've only had uh, eight COVID cases, and that goes to uh, to show that our leadership in the union and our labor force are just tremendous. They're doing an awesome job. So, uh, not that I want to correct you, but uh, I've been on the board since 1992, uh, which is about 30, 30 years. And uh, you, I know you're not going to see it, but I want to show you because this is something that I like to brag about is that this is, this is the picture the newspaper took. Uh, because when I got elected, uh, I was the first, first long term to get elected to the board. And... Uh, I, I closed my statement to the newspaper by saying that I am for growth, but it has to be slow, quality growth. He said, I don't want this port to be turned into another St. Pedro. So that has been my philosophy ever since I've been elected. Uh, of course, you know, we have grown. We have grown, but, uh, but let me tell you what I bring to the board. When I, uh, when I first got elected, I had high school daughters at home, and uh, which means that they're into much into the whole environmental, environmental uh, movement going on. So they make sure that when I got elected, they were excited, but not excited because I was going to create all these jobs. They were, they were excited because I was going to bring the whole environmental issue to the table. Okay. Now, I'll, I'm just going to speak very briefly of two of my daughters. Uh, my philosophy of life is that you're in this world, and you're here to make a difference. And my, my four daughters bought into it. Two of them bought more, in, more than the other two. But let me just uh, comment on, on my first one, Florencia. She wrote a book called Eat Less Water. Okay. And she spent six years researching uh, the effect of water, the fact that we're running out of fresh water. I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. years ago, and uh, because I speak Spanish, I, I, I went into a, a meeting that was, that was run by delegates out of South America. And Armando from, from uh, Bolivia made a statement that has always stayed with me. And he made a statement, and he said this, Today, wars are fought over oil. In the future, wars are going to be fought over water. And that has always stayed with me. And, and, I, and I do believe that. Uh, my daughter has spent all these years researching it, and that's her passion. Her passion. Her contention is that the revolution starts in the kitchen by what we cook, by what we eat. She's an expert on soil. 
she's an expert on trees. When in January, when I first got elected, we had our first meeting with our staff here, and 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 we were going to redo the whole landscaping of, of the port with uh, in planning plans that would be good for the for the water, uh, and we were going to take this whole idea of planting trees. All we were we were going to beautify the whole city of Juanin. We were going to plant trees all over the place, but then COVID came and and the world went upside down. My other daughter, who's an anthropologist. She lives in the Sierra Madre of Chihuahua. Uh, she's married to a Ramuri Indian. People know them as Tarumara Indians because they have the ability to run for hundreds of miles without stopping. Uh, she decided to stay there. And so she, her husband is involved with, with the whole deforestation that's taking place in the Sierra Madre of Mexico. So uh, one of the natives got arrested for trying to stop the illegal logging of the sierras. And my, my daughter began to do a, a videotape, which if you go against the, the forces here in the, the, the government in Mexico, you know, you're, you're in trouble. So as so a father and as a Vietnam veteran, I kept thinking, what the hell? If my daughter gets kidnapped, I'm gonna have to run up all my buddy uh, Vietnam friends who were in war and just, go down to Mexico and, and try to rescue my daughter. I mean, those, those are the things that, that I, as a father, have gone through raising kids that they're out there trying to make a difference. So, so those are my two daughters, okay? At the beginning, at the beginning when I first got elected, uh, environmental issues were not really part of our platform. In, in terms uh, in, uh, in the board and uh so it was an issue for me uh, being so ambitious about about turning the port green that i wasn't getting too much too much love from the rest of the, from the rest of the board members but gradually gradually i, I said the board began to change the, the, the slowly but surely the board began to change so now I can very I, now I can probably say that finally after 12 years after 12 years we have seen significant changes here at our board. It started with the change of the administration that's taken taken us uh, far farther than we ever expected. Uh, I work with board members who are totally open uh, to to better the world and. Uh, it's it's just it's just uh, I mean I'm happy to come here and and and, uh, and and be part of it. So climate change began our was our was our biggest concern. Okay, so with a with a new staff that that we we have, we are we are tackling it. And let me show you. Let me just tell you some of the things that we're that we're doing. Our green team is doing here here at the port. Now, since 2015, our environmental management framework, we have invested over $20 million, okay, to combat climate change, okay, $20 million. Now, secondly, we installed an air monitor at one of the, one of the schools uh, in, our, in the South, South Oxnard community. And uh, I uh, didn't know if I could say this, but uh, the air is now cleaner than it was 32 years ago when I first started here. So I can I, I can honestly say that we have we have done tremendous. The fact that our ships are coming in now they get they get plugged into to our electric source. Our vehicles that we use, our maintenance vehicles, our warfaring use vehicles, they're all electric. We have now brought in a crane that is going to be uh, totally electric. So, you know, we, we are the greatest sport in the country, uh, not because we're cute, all right? Because our team has done all the work, all right? We have, we have earned that distinction of being the greatest sport. But with that, it also 
brings in responsibilities. See? So we have to stay in front of the line. Of all the agencies in the county, we're we're the leading leading uh, enterprise in terms of, of keeping everything green, and we, and we're going to continue that. We 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 are committed to to do whatever we need to do in order to. We're not going to solve we're not going to solve the problem. It's it's a world problem, right? But we're doing our our thing with our staff to do the best we can. We're educating the community. I realize that this year has been devastating for uh, California with the fires we've had. Uh, last month was the hottest September in, in the history of the earth in this country. If you read the Washington Post, there's an article that says that when Santa Barbara and Church County are the hottest, they're, they're becoming hotter than any other place in the country. So that's kind of alarming okay, when, when things are like that are happening. But uh, despite that, despite the fact that, uh, that all this chaos is happening all over the world, there's there's still some some good things that they're, they're they're doing you know we're we're doing some good things and let me let me bring let me bring you some uh, some of the stuff that we're doing here after I finish my talk you're gonna see a, a a short video of what our port is doing in order to to it's part of the movement that's taking place to save our oceans because our oceans are just as important as our forests. Uh, I know that uh, last week the governor signed a, a decree where uh, we're, he's reserving 30% of the land that's not, that's not going to be used. But some of us think about the ocean or the beach just to go to the beach and that's it. Uh, the oceans are, are just as important or probably even more important than, than, than our forests. I mean, the forests are, are, are everything's important. Right? Everything's very important. So. Uh, Let me go to the next one. Now, I know that the port is in good hands. We have our we have our environmental team doing our best. We're 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 not stopping anytime soon. We're going to continue with with our with our philosophy of of uh, combating climate change. One of the things that I enjoy doing uh, is humanitarian stuff. That's that's basic. That's what I really bring to the to the board. Because remember, I'm a, I'm a forklift driver. I drove a forklift for 51 years. Uh, even though I mean I'm I, I'm a college educated, but I uh, I'm not that well knowledgeable. Okay, but I know what I can do. In my community, and uh, and that the board members have allowed me to do this. Sometimes they think I'm kind of crazy, but uh, they they still allowed allowed me. I'll give you a couple of examples. Last year through the banana festival, we had a banana festival. Uh, I uh, I uh, we we fill a container, a 40 foot container, a chiquita container full of books clothing for a school in San Jose, Guatemala. We were able to do that. We didn't do it totally at the, at the, in, in October, but by uh, January, we had the container with about 500 boxes of, of clothing, books, and what have you. So we wanted a trade mission to Guatemala, and, and uh, we, we delivered, we delivered the, the, the container to the school. Now, this kid, this kid, remind me of me because I grew up poor in Mexico. So uh matter of fact I almost cried. Well I think I did cry. But they were so happy to get clothing, to get books. And most of the parents who send their kids to that school, they live off the garbage dump. So they go there and, and, and pick things that they can recycle. So those those are the those were the communities that we delivered our, our the container. 
This year I was excited because we, I was going to send a container to Chapa, Mexico, because Chiquita happens to stop by in Chapa and pick up the organic bananas. So the, the folks from, from that company said, Jess, I said, next year we'll set up a, we'll set up a, a school in Chapas. We already know the people and they'll be, they, they would love to receive, to receive your goodness. Uh, unfortunately, with, uh, with uh, COVID, uh, we have to cancel our banana festival. But what we did, thanks to the board again, is that we diverted some of that money from the festival to our community. So rather than, rather than, rather than uh, bringing people to a festival, we took the bananas to them. So since March, we have what we call a, a feeding the front line. And 36, for 36 weeks, we have, we have done food distribution throughout, throughout the county, uh, giving people food. And of course, bananas, you know, uh, bananas are essential. You need them. So uh, we couldn't go, we, we couldn't have the banana festival, but, but we, we're, we're doing something good for the community. It's all about, it's all about sharing, sharing what we have, you know, with, with our community and, and we're doing awesome work. As a matter of fact, next Saturday, uh, because we cannot have a presidential dinner, I want to have a presidential lunch. So, uh, and the purpose of that is going to be that I want to celebrate and honor all those volunteers that have helped and are still helping every Saturday. So I, uh, I mean, COVID-19 this year is historical and I want it to be part of our history. It's something that we can, uh, so all our, all our, all our volunteers are going to get, a, are going to get a plaque, a plaque depicting what we're doing 2020. Because 2020 is going to be a year that uh, is going to be with us for a long time. It's unforgettable. The events that happen are historical, and I just wanted to document them. Now, so after hanging around here for 51 years, uh, yeah, now I'm retired. So now I can become a student again, and so I I discovered I discovered this uh, this English person, Sir David at at Edinburgh on 60 Minutes, and uh, what he has to say he is 94 years old, and he has uh, documented the Earth, and he's saying that if we don't take important measures right now in history as if we're all gonna go away so my message to you who is who's listening at home is that i'm not suggesting that we go out and and, and demonstrate and, and to save the world but we have a responsibility for our our, our kids our grandkids to try to make this world a better place for them and all of us can do our, our part differently but if you don't take anything from this meeting today please it's our world we gotta save it thank you and god bless Uh, please stand by. I believe we have a, a video coming. One moment, please.
Unfortunately, it doesn't look like that video is going to run right now. Maybe we can come back to it later. Um, so let's move on. Our next speaker uh, is the port's CEO and director, Kristen Dikas. Uh, Kristen repeatedly demonstrates her ability to build vision and implement strategy through open collaborative processes that foster results. The port is, has experienced substantial growth during her tenure, which I'm sure she will highlight in her remarks. She has been at the helm of the Port Awanimi since February 2012. Prior to serving uh, the Port of Wanimi, Kristen served as the CEO and Port Director for the Port of New Bedford, Massachusetts, the nation's number one value fishing port. Under her leadership, the Port realized significant growth in port development, cruise, and recreational boating activity. Kristen is recognized by trade association officials for her impressive work in leveraging economic development through international trade promotion and for her service on several federal shipping and port committees. She's the first woman to lead the Port of Wanimi in its 83 year history. Kristen has a collection of awards and recognitions from local state and national shipping and logistics organizations. We are truly lucky to have her here in Ventura County. Uh, Kristen, I am turning the presentation over to you. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Nancy, for um, having us here today. Our gratitude out to the Chamber, not only for uh, your participation in today's State of the Port, but also for your dedication and support and leadership um, and being such a strong partner with the Port. We, we are very grateful for that partnership and for the business community here. I'd also like to thank UCLA um, for being today's sponsor. And with that, I will run uh, the state of the port. So here we go. So we're celebrating 83 years of being a, a strategic port here in the West Coast for the fourth largest port now in California. So it's LA, Long Beach, Oakland, us. Um, this is a snapshot of our leadership. I'd like to commend them for all the great work that they do out in the community and for being such stewards of the environment and stewards of the port. And uh, without them, we couldn't get anything done. And they have just really brought consensus and leadership. Um, this is the Oxnard Harbor District. Um, if you can see the uh, yellow map here. And our harbor, our harbor commissioners are elected. And to be elected to serve on the board, you do need to live in that geopolitical jurisdiction named the Oxnard Harbor District. So that is actually our legal name. And our harbor commissioners serve four-year terms. And so you'll have two up for election, and then you have three up for election. And this year, we are in an election year. Um, our, mission and vision, uh, our mission and vision is pretty simple. Um, we're here to serve the community and create economic and social good. Um, some folks may not realize this, but we actually don't take any money from the taxpayer. So we run a little bit different than a typical business. So we actually drive all our revenues from the private sector, but once they're inside the walls of the port, because we're a public agency, uh, we actually are owned by the taxpayer and serve the community. So we're not a, a profit making machine. We're here to actually enrich the community and not create the rich port, but create the prosperous, prosper, um, uh, prosperous community. So I put this little slide in here because it's a fun um, tidbit. Our Lieutenant Governor has picked the Port of Wanimi to be um, the port to showcase why ports matter and trying to drive a message to the common person, um, why ports and logistics are important. And she put this quote out um, and she says it whenever she's talking about trade and commerce in California ports. So did you know the port of Wanimi imports over 3.3 billion bananas a year? That's enough for every man, woman and child in the United States of America to have 10 bananas. But um, that gives you a sense of the throughput of, of bananas that come in through our port. Um, with, which right now in this slide, you can see our number one top trading partner is Mexico and that volume is actually bananas. 
On the other side of the coin, a big commodity and a pillar industry for us is our automotive segment. And our top trading partner is actually Korea. And that's both on the import and export side for automobiles. So we actually import a lot of Hyundai's and Kia's, but export cars manufactured here in the United States, General Motor products to South Korea. So this gives you a sense of our global presence and all the different countries that we conduct commerce with. So let's talk a little bit about tonnage and, and what comes in through the port. So um, we do around 1.6, 1.635 million tons a year. Our milestone year was actually last year um, with 1.65 million tons. And you can see, despite having to be up against COVID and um, some pretty big challenges, what I'll get to in a minute, um, we actually really didn't see that much of a dip in cargo and revenue. So that's a good story. And that's um, good for our community because it means we can continue to support us economically with um, good paying jobs, while at the same time, earn enough revenues to continue to give back to the community and invest in our environment. Um, so with that, I'm gonna jump into our next slide. Another good story that we have to tell is that not only are we growing and we're growing our, our revenues and, and our reserves, we're also reducing our debt significant, uh, significantly. So we uh, early on uh, brought a $35 million bond debt and now that's going down to 8 million um, this fiscal year and next fiscal year, it will go down to $6 million. So we're in a very healthy fiscal situation here at the Port of Winnemi. Our, our, bank, our bank book looks good. So I think there's probably a lot of interest in what COVID has meant to the port. So I'll walk through some of that and I'll start on the operational side. So at first, you know, all of a sudden there's a pandemic, what do you do? So I commend my operations team um, for stepping up and standing a continuity of operations plan and getting out and working with all the tenants of the port to make sure we had a harmony amongst all our plans so that we had a response strategy and communications in place should we have a COVID incident. Um, we have a whole mechanism for communicating across all of our, our tenants and customers. And I, again, I'd like to uh, commend the longshoremen as our commissioner did earlier for all they've been doing to really keep the port safe. They've done phone dispatches, everyone's wearing masks, we've distributed PPE, and everyone's really playing by the rules and it's made a big difference in keeping everyone safe. Um, the other interesting technology that we deployed in part of this crisis is something called Everbridge, which is a texting system. So if there's any incident going on around COVID or any other port emergency, we can in real time get information out to everyone. We have signs up all over the port so our truckers and other customers can tap in and participate in the Everbridge system and stay well informed. So that's been a really great tool. So on the cargo side of things and the flow of business, what happened when uh, COVID hit? Well, the first thing we had to deal with was, was that they closed the retail showrooms for our automobiles, yet we had 32,000 cars in transit on their way to the Port of Winnemi. And so we had to get really creative in ways to seek solutions of where we were gonna put all this inventory, inventory, really not knowing when the showrooms would open. And our local community colleges, a CSUCI in Quebec really stood up and said, we'll help you because our schools are closed. We'll take automobiles if you need them. But we were able to solve that riddle and get cars and inventory under control. But there was a little bit of a panic on that end. And then right after that, we, we saw the cease of manufacturing altogether and then knew we were gonna have a, a dead zone, if you will, in the import and of and export of automobiles. On the container side and the fruit side, we did continue as a essential workforce to get the, the containers and the fruit into the grocery stores and also on the export side of things. But we did see some hiccups there as well. Certain fruits, higher end fruits, weren't selling quite as well. Um, if you at that time, if you went to the store, you probably could get a very good deal on a pineapple, but some of the higher end um, fruits weren't moving quite as well as the bananas were. Um, but that story kind of changes as we moved into uh, uh, later in the situation. But that was like the initial thing we had to deal with a kind of a backlog a little bit on containers because inventory wasn't moving so quick. And then we had all these cars in transit. 
So looking now, once we solved the problem of where to put the cars, we kind of had to dissect and forecast what is our future now, given this new environment? What does this mean in terms of throughput of automobiles, which is um, actually a pillar industry for us and our highest revenue maker? So it was something we took very seriously and we had to make some pretty significant slashes to our budget. But when you look at what the professionals and the experts were saying out in the uh, auto logistics industry, they forecasted a worst case scenario of 6% decline in cargo th or in, in um, automobile manufacturing and a worst case scenario of 28%. And so all of our 10 manufacturers of automobiles stopped production of cars at some point along the supply chain. So for instance, in the month of May, we had a, a week where we had no um, what we call roll on, roll off ships, row row ships, which are the, the um, uh, vessels that move our automobiles. And uh, that was pretty stunning because we're used to having close to 10 car ships a week and parking 10,000 automobiles. So it was a little bit of a shock to the system to say the least. And then another week we had a, a row row ship come in with no cars, but 194 pieces of general cargo. So it, it was quite a shock to the system. And so we had to get really, um, we were, as I said in the earlier slide, we have very healthy reserves, but we did really have to look closely and read through our budget and forecast what the realities um, are gonna be moving forward. On the fruit side of things, there, there was some question marks too, not only you know, were some of the higher end commodities not moving as well, what was really the fate of fruit? You know, are schools gonna open? You know, or where are the bananas gonna go? We're not having a certain events, um, you know, at, at, for instance, Easter, um, uh, not as many big family gatherings. So there was a lot of things that would really impact um, the movement of fruit. And so it was really hard to predict. You know, I put the crystal ball up there, but, um, it, it's, it was just really having to go at the most, in, in the budgeting process at least, the kind of the, the most cautious budget we possibly could, not really knowing where our industry was gonna go. So here's a snapshot of what happened in the last quarter of, the, of the, our fiscal year because of um, the COVID impact. So our automobiles went down 13.5%. Now this is a year look, but the real hit was in that last quarter. Um, auto exports went down 17%. Our um, bananas went down. Um, I mentioned those reasons why, but that's a pretty significant dip because that's a, a commodity that's really inelastic to demand. Um, it's a flat commodity. Usually people will eat a banana in a recession or um, when the economy is very strong. So that was that's an unusual statistic. Um, interestingly enough, we did see um, imports on on the uh, avocados, pineapples, and melons and pears actually go up, although that doesn't mean they moved as well in the marketplace, but we did see more of that product coming in. Um, and then exports also went up on the fruit side and we handled a, a citrus uh, vessel for the first time in many years. So that's a good news story for our local growers here um, that we were able to keep exports strong. Um, fish took a tremendous hit, mostly because restaurants were closing. Um, and then our general cargo took a, a, a pretty significant hit as well because that type of cargo um, comes on our, our roll on roll off ships. And if you don't have those ships coming into port, you're gonna have less of that cargo. So that was kind of the initial fact of the economy for the port in that last quarter of fiscal year 20. So let's talk now some good news and, and the recovery side of things. So um, if you look at the blue, I mean, excuse me, the green line in the middle, that's how we budgeted based on those trends and those forecasts that we're getting from experts. Um, if you look at the yellow line, that tells you what we did in a very strong year last fiscal year. And if you look at the darker green line, that tells you how we're actually doing. So in each scenario now for the first quarter of this fiscal year, meaning July 1 through August, um, we're actually, or, or September, we're actually performing very well. And so our forecasts were a little bit conservative. So the auto cargo is quite strong. Um, we're only down 8%, well trending towards the best case scenario of 6%, as opposed to that worst case scenario of 28%. Interestingly, our fruits are actually up and our bananas are doing really well this first quarter, as well as our fresh fruit exports and imports. 
Um, on the revenue side, um, we're about 8% behind where we were last year, um, but 23% better off than we thought we were going to be. So we're holding on strong. And again, I think this is a good story for the community because we're going to be able to keep people working. Um, and being able to reinvest in our infrastructure and in our environment, in our community. So the commissioner mentioned this, so I won't go into too much detail, but part of our response and recovery was being able to give back to the community in a different way. We're not holding our, our banana fest, but actually holding these food drives. Um, we've done 38 of them. We've distributed 300 tons of fruit and vegetables that come through the port. Um, I commend our customers for their participation. It's valued around $250,000. So, um, big numbers and, and big impact for our community. And we continue to press on. Um, despite COVID, we're not, we're, we're trying to still get out and do the good work the port does. Uh, we just celebrated California Clean Air Day uh, last week and we were out planting trees at Oxnard College. Commend the finance team that we have for getting an excellence in financial reporting for the 10th year in a row. And we were actually recognized by the American Association of Port Authorities, which is um, a, a pretty big organization that spreads across Mexico, Canada, the United States, and the Caribbean for our uh, award of excellence in our COVID response here at the Port of Wanini. So some good news there. So now where are we and where are we headed? And so we're now in the process of updating our strategic plan. Our, our 2020 plan is about to expire. And so we're now gonna launch our 2030 plan and we're going to do this through a very open and transparent community process. And to kind of give some history on our strategic planning here at the Port of Wanimi, um, when I started with a board of five elected officials, I thought it would be prudent and strategic to have visioning workshops. And the vision of our board came together around these really important pillars. Originally, it was economic vitality, environment, innovation and technology. We also had strategic partnerships and, and marketing as part of the pillars in our initial plan. Um, and that visioning process really was the way to build up these pillars and understand and build consensus and get direction from our leadership on where the port was gonna go and where and how we were gonna invest. Um, in you know the in the environment that we're in now, we're kind of shaking things up a little bit. We've done a lot in marketing and branding, so we're actually going to do a standalone marketing plan. Pleased to say that we hired Stacy Miller of Public Affairs to help us launch that strategic plan for marketing. Um, so that will be a standalone where we'll target audiences in all of our pillars, but we're also um, kind of switching gears and, and really taking a hard look at our infrastructure and how we remain com competitive with so many things changing in, in, the, uh, in the environment or in the, the shipping industry. And then we're also kind of taking our strategic partnerships and really spelling out the importance of social equity and community and partners. And these aren't glued yet. We're gonna be having open processes to discuss them in charrettes um, to make sure that we have the buy-in from our partners such as you and our community. So on the economic um, vitality uh, pillar, this is, kind of what we bring to the table in terms of economic prosperity. We um, create 15,830 uh, jobs, uh, 15,834 jobs through trade related activities. We bring significant tax revenues back into the community and um, we create quite an overall economic impact of $1.7 billion, moving $9 billion worth of cargo through the port here. So these are impressive numbers. And you can see from this chart how they've grown over time from 2013 to 2018. And the good news here is the jobs are local. So you can tell that you know the majority of these uh, jobs are actually in the, in the Oxnard Harbor District area. But beyond that, we also reach well into the county and our major, I think we're the fourth largest employer in the, in the county right now in Ventura County. Um, we also, under the wisdom of our, our board, put together a project labor agreement. Um, so now when we go out and we do big construction projects, we work with our trades union groups to hire local labor. And we just launched our first project last summer where we demolo um, demolished a warehouse and we well beat the targets for local hires. We created 83 jobs and we hired 73% of the labor locally, which is well beyond the 33% target. So this has been really successful for us and we're really proud that we're able to put our local labor to work. 
So when we think about economic vitality and strategic planning, um, we also look at market forces and what would be good for the port and also the, the local business community here. And so we're really honing in and looking at building a service to Asia. Um, we also have to understand what's happening in the shipping industry. There's a lot of consolidation and we wanna make sure that we're with the winners and we are right now. Maersk is uh, one of our, our lining shippers here that is one of the uh, companies in the Canadian containerized freight that's really doing well and not facing bankruptcy like some other companies are. So we got a winning company there. Um, there's a trend away from what's called break bulk cargo where um, the bananas and, and other fruits come in on pallets um, in ships with big refrigerators in the hold. Well, that's a thing of the past um, for the Port of Winemi and now all of our fruit comes in containers. So we really have to think about in strategic planning, what does that mean for us and how do we um, make sure we remain competitive? And then, you know, being in the automotive business, if we're all gonna be driving electric cars come 2035, we really gotta think about how we modernize the port with plugs and everything that we're gonna need to have all these EV vehicles at the port. Um, the commissioner um, uh, really honed in here on the, in the environment. We're doing a lot of great things. The one project I'll point out is that we have a three hundred, I mean, a three million dollar grant from um, the Air Resources Board, where we're building the backbone infrastructure into the port so that we can plug in our cranes and other electric equipment that we're procuring with that grant money. So, pretty exciting stuff going on there. And I do have a very short video. I'll see if I can be successful here in running that real quick. It's a couple minutes. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Well, it looks like I'm gonna have to bypass the video too. What we'll have to do, I'll work with Nancy so we get our videos out into the community, but they don't seem to be showing up here in, in our, our loaded website. So that's okay. I'm getting a little short in time anyways, and I want to make sure we wrap up by um, our timeline of three o'clock here. So we'll, we'll get the videos out to everybody. Um, on the pillar of innovation and technology, uh, we are um, built out a program we call MAST, our Maritime Advanced System Technology Laboratory, where we really allow the port to open its door to be an incubator for new technologies in the pipeline, create an entrepreneurial spirit with our local community in testing new types of technologies that support the maritime environment and can also transfer into other areas such as ag and the like. Um, this has now morphed into something bigger and even greater. We partnered up with the Navy, a company called Matter Labs that you may have heard of that is a, a real venture uh, capital kind of organization that tracks. It's a magnet for new kind of technologies that are out there. And then of course our economic development collaborative to build a company or a, a, a collaborative called Fathomworks where we're really taking it to the next level and working with our STEM kids in the community. We had an event last year, we had 400 kids come out and text, text, um, test new technologies. But the goal here is to take technology, to put it to work to solve local um, problems for the port, for the Navy, and most importantly, for the community. So if you wanna learn more about this, it's really exciting. It's on the cusp of innovation. And I think it's gonna bring a lot back into Ventura County as a whole and really put us on the cutting edge of of um, uh, the next Silicon Valley, if you will. On the pillar of social equity, the commissioner mentioned that we do have the air quality monitors out there. We will present the results to our board on Monday night, and then we're really gonna start messaging and sharing this data with the community. But right now we can say that the, the results are very encouraging that the port is making a difference by all the environmental work that it does. Um, we also have a trade and logistics class. I'll mention it just real quick, but um, we have students come in here uh, for about a 12 week program, one day a week, now it's virtual in the COVID environment, but um, they learn from experts out in the field and they get an education on career paths related to the maritime industry, whether they talk to a customs official or one of our customers or whatever it might be. Um, so they really get a breadth of uh, exposure to, to career paths. And then we give them a test at the end and the excelling student gets um, a paid internship at the port. And so we're gonna have to figure out the virtual way. It's working, we're doing it, and we're gonna keep going at it and we'll get an intern with a, a virtual program. And then again, I mentioned this, but in this pillar, we're really gonna get out organically in the community and hear from everybody as we get buy-in for port development, expansion, environment, sustainability, and all of that good stuff. 
And then finally, the last pillar here is infrastructure. I mentioned the need to modernize the port towards containerization. And so this is the project that we did with our PLA, where we demolished a building and uh, opened space up for containerized freight um, and, and better staging for our cranes. So this is a little video showing the building come down, but all of those workers out there and the majority of them are from our local trades. We are also deepening the harbor, which is exciting. That project kicked off about a year and a half ago and it should be done next March. They're currently dredging the federal, or they'll start dredging the federal part of the channel come October. We have um, completed the berth side um, work here. And the good news of this is that we're able to take the sand and bring it around the corner for um, uh, beach nourishment, um, which is so important now uh, to our, uh, not only the port and our infrastructure, but the city of Port Wanimi and the challenges it faces around erosion. And then we're thinking big as we're moving in the strategic direction of planning, how, how do we stack cars? Well, maybe a parking uh, structure makes sense anti-cranes, um, more efficient movement of containers. So we're really thinking big and, and, and working with all of our customers and industry partners to really determine how we best build inside and outside the gate. And of course, those conversations are so critical with the community as we look at port expansion and opportunities. And the bigger and better we do, the more and more that we can invest in greener and cleaner programs and create more and more jobs. Um, so summing it up, um, the story is a good one for the ports that move cargo. We're actually doing okay. Um, as you saw, our performance is, is kind of in that better case scenario. And unfortunately, the story is a little bit more of a question mark for some of the cruise ports out there. And certainly um, our passion goes out to all those in the airline industry um, with the challenges of COVID and travel and, and what those industries are up against. But for our community, the story is good because we are able to keep cargo moving and we're able to keep people working. Um, and, that's, and that's what we do. So that is the presentation itself. And if time allots, Nancy, I, I do have a quiz. Um, and we have some prizes here. We have a little beach theme. We have a towel. This is a beach towel. Um, we have a beach mat. We have a cooler. Um, so you can get yourself out to the beach. And then when you get back, you can have a cup of coffee. And if you go out, you can put on your Port Wanimi mask. And if you're stressed from COVID as we all are in the pandemic and all the juggles of Zoom meetings and kids at home Zooming or taking care of our elders or whatever it is your challenge again, we got a little stress banana for you. Squeeze it <laughs> so that you can uh, get a little tension out. So with that, I have three quick questions and Nancy tells me if you answer the question by typing into the question bar, um, we know who the winner will be. So the first question is, if you were looking at um, the presentation, how old is the Port of Wanimi, the Oxnard Harbor District? And commissioners that are on the line, you're not allowed to answer. <laughs> and staff for that matter. Uh, we have we have quite a few uh, people with the correct okay. answers, so they were paying attention. Okay. Uh, the first one that arrived was James Heim. All right, uh, James. The first one to answer. All right, James. We'll get your address from Nancy, and we'll sell you. Uh, I will. We'll mail you your prize. Okay. By value, what country is the port's top trade partner? By value. Nancy, anyone answering? Uh, not yet, but we're still getting some in from the last question. So. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, again, type your type your answers in the uh, the question module. Here we go. We have one. Woohoo! They're really coming in. Uh, we have a, I believe is a correct answer. You want to tell us what the answer is, Kristen? The answer is Korea. Okay. And Rosie Ornelius uh, was the first one to answer that correctly. Excellent. All right, Rosie. Um, we'll make sure you get your prize. We'll get your address from, uh, from Nancy and we'll send you your care package. Okay. Last one. Here we go. How many tons of cargo moved through the port in 2020? question. There were three bullets up there on the slide. <laughs> uh, 
Let's give it a couple minutes for those to post. Okay. Still getting a lot of Koreas in here. Here we go. We have, well, you need to tell me what the answer is. So. There, we go. There's the answer. <laughs> there you go. Lynn Luna. Lynn Luna is All the right. first one cool. correct. All right. We'll make sure we get our address and get our prize. And again, thank you to the chamber. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I want to give a shout out to one of your board members, Donna Lacayo of my team for all the work that she and her team did to put this um, PowerPoint together and help Chess and I um, be able to participate in this virtual setting. So thank you, Donna, and your team. And to the rest of my staff out there, thank you for helping and all you do to make cargo move. Uh, we have uh, one quick question, um, and then I think we're going to have to to move on so everyone okay. can get to their three o'clock Zoom calls. Okay. Um, this one's regarding the deepening of the of the port. Um, when is the project uh, so, uh, scheduled to be done, um, and the, how big will the ships be then that can come in? Okay, so um, last March. Uh, we finished the construction of the deepening in front of the berth itself, in front of the wharf. And um, so that piece is done and we were fortunate to get a Tiger grant, a $12.3 million federal grant from the uh, US Department of Transportation to help us finance that deepening project. And now come October, the US Army Corps of Engineers will be doing their part in deepening the federal channel um, which is a, a project at the tune of around $8 million. And we anticipate that will be done in March. And it not only benefits the port, but being a shared harbor with the Navy, it certainly gives them opportunity to um, deepen their, their wharves and, and bring in uh, different types of vessels as well. For us, it will allow us to bring in slightly um, larger vessels. It also helps existing um, um, tra uh, vessel traffic because they can load heavier and bring more cargo on the same ships. Um, as well as not have to play with tides. If they're load heavy, sometimes they couldn't come in if their tide wasn't deep enough for the vessel to sit at the wharf. So um, it is gonna be a game changer. It's gonna not make us San Pedro as, as the commissioner said earlier, but it is gonna allow us to capture our niche and remain competitive and do good work for our community as well by replenishing the sand um, in Port Wanini. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, we we really appreciate your presentation today. Um, I learned a lot more about the port, and I I hope everyone else did. So. Super. Um, and Nancy, maybe we could work with you to push the videos out. That'd be great. That'd okay. Be great. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Take care, everyone. Be safe. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us today. I hope you all gained uh, some knowledge about uh, what happens at the port and how great of an economic engine uh, the port is in our region. Uh, please join us again November 12th. Uh, we'll have the Oxnard Business Outlook featuring Bruce Densley, CEO of the Economic Development Collaborative. Um, in the meantime, don't forget to vote. Watch uh, our Tuesday newsletters for information on the Chamber's position on local measures and candidates. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye.